Happy Sabbath, everyone. Oh, I know everyone's getting settled, so just want to wish all of you a happy Sabbath. How many of you are happy to be in God's house this morning? It is truly a blessing to be here. You know, as I'm looking outside, the weather had projected for it to be very rainy and thunderstorms, and just seeing the sunshine just lifted my spirits, and I hope it does the same thing for you as well. So I want to welcome all of you, all of our members, and all of our guests to our church service this morning, and I know that God has a special program, a special plan in store for you today. So just a few things that I want to share with you. We're so blessed at our church to always have new members members who are interested in joining our church. Isn't that a great thing? It's a great thing. So I want to introduce to you Ed and Bonnie Koch. So Ed and Bonnie, if you are here, Ed and Bonnie Koch are transferring from the Philadelphia Chestnut Hill SDA Church in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I'll share a little bit about who they are. So Ed is a civil engineer and he will retire in March from Lockheed Martin after 37 years of service. And Bonnie, his wife, is interested in community service and friendship evangelism, and, she all, and Ed also shares the same interest. They have two children who live near to them. So at this time, we will take a motion to accept Ed and Bonnie Koch and our members. I see a hand. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, say aye. aye. So we are welcoming them to our church. Let's give them a round of applause. And we also have Sergio and Tetiana Shulga, and they're coming from Bila Tisverka and in the Ukraine. So I'll share a little bit about them. If they're here, if you can please stand. So there they are. You can look around and you see them. So Sergi is the brother of Svetlana Karen. That's one of our members here at the church. Svetlana, along with her husband Valerie, also recently transferred their membership to Spencerville. Sergi is a designer of leather accessories, and Tatiana is an accountant. They have two daughters, Elena is nine and in the fourth grade, and Anita is four years old. So we'll take now a motion to accept them into membership. I see a hand, is there a second? Second, all in favor, aye. So let's all welcome them into our church. It is a blessing to have you all here. You may be seated. And I just want to share with you this evening at 4 p.m. What time did I say? 4 p.m. here in the sanctuary. We have a very special service and a program in store for you. It's all about religious liberties. And some of you may know what religious liberties are. Some of you may not. And it's important for everyone, invite a friend to come out this afternoon at 4 p.m. We have individuals from the General Conference, our very own Bill Knott and also Todd McFarlane, individuals from the North American Division, an individual from the Pacific Union, and someone from the Baptist Religious Liberties Committee, where we'll be talking about the importance of what religious liberties is and why all of us should really be vested in understanding what it's all about. So make sure that you're here at 4 p.m. and I'm sure that you will enjoy that program. So we want to thank all of you for being here this morning. And as I mentioned, I know that God has a special blessing in store for you. So let's continue to worship God in the beauty of holiness.
Lord, we want to thank you so much for loving us, for being a God that cares about every aspect of our being. So God, we ask that as we are here in this service today, that everything that we do would be acceptable to you. We ask for your Holy Spirit to be upon us and to move throughout this entire service so that we can be transformed and convicted into what you would want us to be. We love you and we thank you for all your blessings. These mercies I ask in name I pray, amen. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see your smiling faces, and what a privilege I have this morning to baptize some of the most beautiful young ladies in the entire church. Uh, Abigail and Madeline have gone through Bible studies. They've been cleared by Pastor Larone, and they are fully-fledged uh, disciples of Jesus ready to give their hearts to God. Uh, one of the joys of, of baptizing these wonderful ladies is just to ask them personally in the back, you know, just tell me, tell me one thing special that you just love about Jesus. And they both put their head down and thought. And then Madeline said, you know, I just love that I can trust Jesus with anything. That he's someone I can rely on. And that's true, Madeline. That's a good reminder for all of us that Jesus is someone we can trust. Even if we don't understand everything, we can trust him. And then I asked Abigail the same question. Abigail said, you know, I love that Jesus loves me <laughs> and that he forgives me of my sins. And uh, it's an amazing thing when at a young age you feel that conviction of God that he's calling you and he wants you to surrender your life to him. And it's a beautiful thing. Um, at this time, I know you have uh, your family and your friends, mom and dad, and some family from Michigan, and uh, students who are classmates of theirs at Spencerville and 
fourth grade and sixth grade who, who are here to support them. I just want to give you an opportunity to stand so they can see you. They were trying to see you in the back. There you are. Uh, and I just, as you stand, I just want to commend mom and dad because we all know that the main discipler of every child is not the pastor at the church or the teacher at the school, even though we do our best to, to take part in that. But we, we want to commend mom and dad for, for discipling these beautiful girls and teaching them the fear of the Lord at a young age and even into their teenage years. So God bless you and thank you family and friends for, for helping them as you've discipled them in the faith as well. You may be seated. Abigail, because you love Jesus and it is your desire to walk with him for the rest of your life, it is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Madeline, because you love Jesus and because you can trust him with your life from here until the end of time and because you've accepted his death and resurrection on your behalf, it is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. We're going to have a special prayer to invite the Holy Spirit to pour himself in a, in a special way after this baptism. Uh, Father in heaven, we are so grateful for Abigail and for Madeline uh, that they made this choice to be baptized as a sign of total commitment and surrender to you. And Lord, as we have written their names in the books here in church, we ask, Lord, that you write their names in the book of heaven. And that in every step of the way, Lord, they would get a deeper sense of your Holy Spirit working in their life. Lord, you have plans for both of these wonderful, beautiful ladies. And Lord, I pray, Father, that just right here and now, through your Holy Spirit, they would start to get a picture, God, of the mighty works you want to do through them. And so, Lord, as a church family, we pray on their behalf. We pray on behalf of the Zappia family that you would watch and guide them as they continue to grow in Christ. And we thank you, Lord, for this special time here today. In Jesus' name, let all God's people say amen. Can I get a motion to officially vote these wonderful ladies into membership? We got a motion. We got a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Congratulations. This is your official church family. No going back to North Carolina on us, okay? <laughs> children's lessons so if the children will come forward and collect the dollar bills on your way up we'll get started
Okay, our lesson this morning is about some things that God's heavenly angels can do for us. I have a story to tell you about when I was a young boy, about seven years old, when an angel saved my dad's life. Do you know that each one of us has a guardian angel? And we should remember every day in our prayers to ask God to have those angels protect us each day when we have our prayers morning and night. My dad was a pastor like Chad, and he was a pastor of the Chestnut Hill Church. And did you hear recently that we just had some people transferred here today from the Chestnut Hill Church in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania? Has anyone ever been to Philadelphia? If you have, raise your hand. Nobody's been to, oh, you've been to Philadelphia. Okay, so you know where it is. Well, yes? Did you want to say something? I've been there too. You've been there too. Good for you. My dad he grew up as a, a farm boy, so we always had a little bit of um, farm stuff in him, and he had a small farm there near Philadelphia. And one day, he was out finishing a little barn that he had built for the chickens and the goats and whatever else they have there with the farm. And my sister and I were in the garage playing in the back of our new car. So we were playing a little game there and pretty soon my mother called out and she said, Jimmy, Jimmy, you forgot to take the cans out in the trash. So I went back up toward the house to get the trash to take them out because I wanted to get back playing again. And I saw up in the sky that there were some dark clouds gathering and there was some thunder and it looked like it was going to storm. Pretty soon there were some big peals of thunder and I was kind of scared. And all of a sudden, out of the sky, two big bolts of lightning came down in the backyard and they hit a little fence that ran all the way down to the barn and I could watch it go down there right where my dad was working on the corner of the barn. We were so afraid when we saw what happened because it split the corner of the barn away and there were little pieces of shingles and wood flying everywhere and there were chicken feathers in the air and we were so scared and we looked and we saw that our dad was standing there so we walked over there and he was stretching out his arms and his leg making sure they all worked and when we talked to him he said, I'm okay but a little voice talked to me just a few seconds before the lightning hit, told me to move away, and he did. And we believe that that was his guardian angel telling him to move out of the way. He had some evangelistic meetings going on in that church, and people were preparing to be baptized, and we think that that old devil was trying to send that lightning down there to hit him so that he couldn't continue to hold those meetings. That lightning bolt was so strong that it melted the wire fence and just blew that barn right apart, but the angel saved his life. You know, Psalms 34, 7 says, the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him, delivereth them. We think the angel of the Lord was camped around us that day. And that's our lesson for today. You can go back to your seats. May we all kneel who are able, and may we bow our heads. Dear Lord, thank you for the Sabbath day where we can stop and worship together. Thank you for the beautiful spring flowers that you give to us to enjoy. And thank you for the blessings of this wonderful music Please send your Holy Spirit to be with Elder Knott as he delivers his message. And Lord, thank you also for your immense sacrifice on the cross for us. We ask that these, all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
I invite you to take out your Bibles and please stand as I read the sermonic text taken from Matthew chapter 27, 38 through 44. You may stand. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking him with scribes and elders said, he saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him, for he said, I am the son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. May the Lord add his richest blessings unto the reading of his holy word. You may be seated. There were two disappointments this last Wednesday morning. One of them was mine, and one of them is yours. Mine was that I got a text from Pastor Chad about 10 a.m. saying that our lunch appointment was going to have to be canceled because he was not feeling well at all and was going in for some tests which have illustrated that he needs to be resting for a while. And that was my disappointment that I didn't get to share a lunch with a good friend, but your disappointment is that he also asked me to preach this morning instead of him. <laughs> Chad, I know you're watching. We're praying that the Lord brings you back quickly and that you're in good health and in good spirits. As mountains go, it's not much. Perhaps 2,500 feet above sea level. Maybe 300 feet above the height of surrounding hills. You wouldn't notice it in the Blue Ridge or in the mountains of the Carolinas. It doesn't have some long, dramatic spine which pilgrims can go up haltingly on their knees doesn't have a steep north face which expert climbers can ascend with their pitons in the granite rock. It doesn't have any glaciers. It has no snow fields on which ice axes and crampons will help you navigate. There's no lack of oxygen at the top. No Sherpa guides are required. And yet, and yet, my friends, no mountain in the world looms larger in the consciousness of people today than the one we will talk about. You can take Kilimanjaro, rising above the savannas of Africa, always blanketed with snow. You can take Vesuvius or Mount Etna, occasionally spewing ash or lava. You can take Olympus, the home of the fabled Greek gods. You can take Mount Fuji, the most climbed mountain in the world. Not one of them, not one of these famous mountains continues to transfix the minds of men and women around the world today like the hill we call Mount Calvary, Golgotha the place of the skull. Maybe it seizes our imaginations in part because we can't know with certainty just where it was. Somewhere on the west side of Jerusalem as it was in the first third of the first century, there was a place where Romans routinely exhibited their executed criminals. Perhaps, as some suggest, it got its name from the skulls of victims left for animals and the elements. 
Maybe, as one more famous theory has it, the hill itself resembled the shape of a human head. Each of the sites proposed for Calvary has its arguments and its partisans. Each one can boast some history for its claim. The fact remains that no one knows for certain which of several hills on the west side of Jerusalem was the place where Jesus suffered and died. Some may sing with great conviction, I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary, but it's a faith that can't be rooted for certain in any specific spot on the earth. That hill far away with its old rugged cross is primarily a place in the mind and in the heart. And perhaps that's the way it should be. We discover that almost everything we know about this hill is drawn from a few scant verses in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. And yet, uncounted volumes have been written about those few scant verses. We discover that everything we know of the history of this mountain happened in a single day in something like six hours between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. on a springtime Friday. And yet it was a day that divided the history of our world in two. It was that one decisive moment from which we date all our realities because of who was there. No wonder, no wonder that we can't leave this mountain alone. No wonder that thoughts of Calvary unsettle us, whether we're believers or agnostics or claim no faith in God at all. No wonder that we're sometimes attracted and sometimes repelled by all that it's come to mean to us. No wonder that we find it necessary periodically to go back to Scripture and in our imaginations to see what there is to see and to, to hear what there is to hear and to feel what there is to feel. I have visited this mountain dozens of times in my imagination. And each time what I see and hear and feel is at least slightly different from the last time. One time, I'm caught by the casual cruelty of the Roman guard who would strip Jesus of his clothes and then gamble for them in his sight. But the next time, I'm struck by the kindness of that Roman soldier who would attempt to offer Jesus a sedative to ease his pain. One visit I remember that both thieves who were crucified with him reviled him and abused him. The next time, the next time I recall that one of them, one of them surrendered to the love that would not let him go and one of them was promised paradise. One trip I hear again the words of Jesus, I thirst. Woman, this is your son. Son, this is your mother. The next time I listen in amazement to what the crowd is chanting as they wait for him to die. Matthew tells us in verse 42 of chapter 27 some of what that crowd was chanting on that fateful day so many Fridays ago. And it takes no great imagination to guess how they said these words. We almost feel the sneers. We see the curled lips. We hear the venom that would taunt a dying man about his weakness and his powerlessness. He saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel, 
Let him come down from that cross now and we will believe in him. Through the years, we've all come to understand that in that hour of cursing and reviling, his enemies spoke more truth of Jesus than they realized. The words that they intended as insults and derision are in fact the glory of the church. He saved others. He cannot save himself. In the moment of atonement, Jesus could save himself and still save all of us who put our trust in him. The plan of redemption Envisioned in the book of Genesis, unfolded in the book of Exodus, typified in the ceremonies of Leviticus, foreshadowed in the rites of Numbers, reiterated in the book of Deuteronomy. The plan of God had made it clear that in order to save others, he couldn't save himself. That which was their greatest taunt has become his greatest glory. He saved others. He did not save himself. And in that hour of cursing and condemning, his enemies also spoke the truth when they said of Jesus, he is the king of Israel. The sign that Pilate had posted above his head said simply in Aramaic and Greek and Latin only that he is the king of the Jews, meaning that he was the king of a people group who had the proper bloodlines and the appropriate pedigree and the right traditions. But in their moment of fury, his enemies spoke more truth than they knew. They called him the king of Israel. The Israel of God has been from the beginning more and larger than a people group called the Jews. Wasn't it Paul, a Jew, who maintained in Galatians 3.29, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Because of his triumph on this mountain, Jesus is the king of Israel. He's the king of all those who in faith came to the altar of sacrifice in the centuries leading up to his cross. And he's the king of all who in the centuries after his cross have looked back in faith to what he accomplished there. Surely Jesus is the king of Israel. But there was something else his taunters said. And though they hardly meant it, the words are haunting nonetheless. Let him come down from the cross now, they said, and we will believe in him. They thought that both halves of that curious line were impossibilities. Here he was, bound and impaled by spikes into tough, rough-sawn crossbeams. Great gashes at his hips and back oozed blood and lymphatic fluid. In places, muscles lay exposed. Blood trickled down his face from the lacerations in his scalp and matted in his beard. His eyes were half swollen from the beatings he had endured. His tongue was swelling from thirst. This was a man who wouldn't last the day. There was no way that he would ever come down from that cross. It was an impossibility. And because of that, it was a safe bet that they never would be required to believe in him. Unless God intervened, which he showed no signs of doing, this deluded visionary would disappear into the dustbin of history like so many other would-be messiahs. It was a safe taunt. The conditions they had set had no chance of coming true. Let him come down from the cross now and we will believe in him. As I sat in my office recently, pondering that line, I suddenly heard it in a new way. And it had a curiously modern ring to it. 
And in my imagination, I saw a different group of people gathered at the top of Mount Calvary, different from the one described in Matthew 27. Gone were the scribes in their somber garb, fingering their phylacteries as they cursed the Son of God. Gone were the Sadducees, for whom this young Messiah represented a dangerous threat of revival and reform and the loss of their control. Gone were the Pharisees, the ones who saw in Jesus a competitor for the claim of the religious conservatives in the land. No, my friends, I saw instead a group of people gathered at the top of Mount Calvary, a group of people who looked remarkably like us. I saw pastors there, and business people there, teachers, homemakers, car mechanics, grad students, little kids, grandparents. But this time, the, the, the air wasn't filled with taunts and reviling. This time, the lips weren't curled in sneers. It was altogether a respectful group, rel relatively quiet, civil, decent. But the one they stared at and the lines they said were identically the same. It was still Jesus on that crossbar of contradiction. His face was just as swollen. His back was just as lacerated. His breathing was just as labored. His blood was just as real. But the words, the words that 20 centuries ago had been hurled at him as a taunt and a dare, oh, they now, they now sounded more like a request or even a plea. Let him come down from that cross and we will believe in him. Let him come down from that cross and we will believe in him. My friends, I tell you this morning that the thing I fear most in the Christian world today and the thing I fear most in my own spiritual life today is the desire to get Jesus to come down off that cross. The thing I fear most among God's people today is the movement toward a crossless Christianity. It may surprise you to hear me say that such a thing is even possible. Oh, I don't mean that we'll come to the point where no one will ever put a cross on the front of a church or no one will ever hang a little crucifix about their neck or that we won't wrap a stylized cross in our sanctuary with yards of purple and white. But what I fear, what I fear from the movements that are afoot in the Christian world and sometimes in our own faith is that we are being taken away, taken away from a real soul-shaking encounter with Jesus Christ on his cross. And that, my friends, is the indispensable foundation of all of our hope of salvation. I include myself in my complaint today. Why is it? that we so seldom talk about the cross. In the last five years, I can count on one hand, at most two, the conversations, the discussions, the Bible studies, the sermons, even the sermons I've preached about the cross, about Mount Calvary. I haven't done better than anyone else. And yet in heaven, we're told, in heaven it's a theme of endless conversation and endless amazement. 
The book of Revelation pictures all the myriad thousands and ten thousands of heavenly beings celebrating and rejoicing and discussing and reveling in the story that has as its focus a Friday afternoon and with Jesus crucified on a hill called Mount Calvary. As Revelation pictures it, it's not just the Lamb of God who's celebrated in heaven. It's the Lamb who was slain who's celebrated in heaven. It's the Lamb who died in place of guilty you and guilty me. He's the toast of heaven. And yet, and yet we sometimes have so little to say about it. Is it because that we're somehow embarrassed by the violence and the blood of the story? Are we afraid that by confessing our faith in the facts of Mount Calvary, we might align ourselves with others in the Christian world who have theologies with which we don't agree? Maybe some of us in our confusion are tempted to strike a bargain that says, um, let him come down from that cross and we will believe in him. My friends, I, I know that these are hard words to hear. Trust me when I tell you that they are also hard words to say. But the Apostle Paul warned us 2,000 years ago that in the story of the cross, there's a fundamental contradiction of our usual ways of thinking and our usual ways of believing. The stunning contradiction of the cross will always mean that we are in danger of moving it to the margins of our faith. Paul used words like stumbling block to describe the story of the cross. Paul called the story of the cross an offense to the natural mind. Paul said that the story of Mount Calvary is foolishness to the mind that isn't constantly being renewed by the Holy Spirit. And to the same degree that we find ourselves personally or as a people shying away from the story of the cross to that same extent we should fear for our own spiritual welfare. It really is enlightening for us to focus on the stories and parables that Jesus told. And if you know me, you know how much I love them. It's ever so challenging to discuss the ethics of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount and in the body of his teaching, and I can easily spend a lovely hour or ten doing that. We can spend enormous amounts of time detailing for ourselves the ways in which we believe that the prophecies of Jesus match up with events now unfolding in our world. But my friends, if in all of our discussions of Jesus, if in all of our study of Jesus, if in all of our preaching of Jesus, we miss that awful and yet wonderful moment when one by one we stand at the foot of that crossbar of contradiction and look squarely at the Lord who laid down his life for us. If we miss that, we have missed the vital heart of Christianity and the vital heart of Seventh-day Adventism. My friends, I want to put it candidly this morning. If our Christianity is becoming the crossless kind it is also in danger of becoming the worthless kind. The story of the death of Jesus Christ on Calvary is not an option. It's not an extra. It's not plan B, C, or D. It is the essential story on which every other story of Jesus is based and finds its meaning. The cross is either the vital center of our personal stories and our story as a people, or else we aren't telling the story of Jesus. Forty years ago, when people used to watch the evening news, 
I saw images of an elderly man weeping, weeping in front of a huge crowd gathered in front of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. The newscaster did his best with a difficult Slavic name, Franciszek Vojanacek. He gave a kind of one-minute summary that was all the evening news had time for. It seems that this aging man, now bent over with years, had come to Rome to honor a man who changed the story of his life. It was 1945, and the place was Auschwitz, a Nazi concentration camp in Europe. Wojanacek was a native of Poland. He had gotten caught up in the destruction of his country at the outbreak of the Second World War, and he had been condemned to hard labor in the camps along with thousands of Jews and socialists and intellectuals and patriots. And because the Nazis ruled by terror, they staged ghastly reprisals whenever there was any lack of discipline in the camp. On this particular day, 10 prisoners had escaped, had somehow gotten past the guard towers and the barbed wire and made a dash for freedom. 10 men must die to pay for the 10 escapees the commandant had declared. And the next morning at roll call, the crisp lieutenant simply counted off every tenth man in the cell block lined up in formation. And he informed them that by the decree of the commandant, every tenth man would be starved to death. Vojanacek heard the counting of the lieutenant as he came down the line. And with sickening quickness, he realized before the lieutenant reached him that he was going to be the tenth man. He began to cry, to convulse on the spot. My wife, he sobbed. My children, what will they do? Instantly, a voice behind him spoke up, a voice belonging to a thin, emaciated man with a faraway look in his eye. I'll take his place, the voice said. I don't have any family. I'll take his place. The, the lieutenant's face was frozen with shock. What did you say, prisoner? I said, I'll take his place said the prisoner who was only known by his number to the guards, but was known to his fellow prisoners as Father Colbe. It wasn't a moment for the lieutenant to betray any emotion. And Voyanacek was still on the ground convulsing with sobs. Off you go, the officer said. And with barely a backward glance, Maximilian Colby and nine others were marched off to an isolation ward. Hunger does its work more quickly when you're already on a starvation diet. Within days, others of the ten began to die. And one by one, Father Colby held them in his arms. And he told them, God has not forgotten you. Finally, after three weeks, only Maximilian Colby was still alive. Something in this indomitable priest clung to life with the tenacity that his guards found amazing. At last, even they couldn't stand it any longer, and with an injection of poison, they, they ended his suffering forever. Vojanacek survived the camp. 
survived the war. He even was reunited with his family when Poland reappeared on the map of Europe late in 1945. But always, he says, always, he remembered in every day, in every breath, the priest who gave up his life for him. He revered the man who volunteered to take his place and die in his place for no other reason than that's exactly what Christ would do. No, better than that, that's exactly what Christ did. My friends, the natural heart is offended by a story like that because it doesn't fit the world's concept of justice. Every man must bear his own burden. The world says, no one can take your place. You do the crime, you do the time. Oh, sure, they say Father Colby was a wonderful guy, but don't try to pretend that anyone can really die in another's place. A story like that is also foolishness to those who are perishing without the cross because the whole idea of Jesus dying in place of sinful you and sinful me is inconceivable to them. It's irrational to them. It's even irritating to them. It's impossible that God could put on Jesus the weight of all our sins. They say each of us is individually responsible to God. We can't stand in for each other. But my friends, I tell you this morning, because the word of God tells you this morning, that it is not only possible that God would appoint one man, Jesus Christ, to bear the iniquities of the whole world, but that it's plausible. And I further tell you on the basis of the word of God that it's not only plausible, but that it's likely. And I go on to remind you that in the word of God, it's not only likely, he has already done it. God has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's God's sovereign choice as creator and redeemer of fallen you and fallen me. He has designated Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man, as the one whose death on Mount Calvary would completely and finally pay the penalty for all our sin and all our shame if we only put our trust in him. Do you believe it? And the only response that's needed today from sinful you and sinful me is a simple yes or a simple no. But as Jesus says, let your yes be yes, and let your no be no. No more of this, well, maybe I will, and maybe I won't. Maybe Jesus saves me, or maybe I do it by myself. Maybe I'm saved through the blood of the Lamb, or maybe I get there by cleaning up my own act. My friends, I hope none of us is under any illusions this morning. Jesus does not force us to accept his sacrifice in our place. Jesus doesn't require us to believe in a story about Mount Calvary. If we insist on bearing the full penalty for all we have done, he will not take away our power of choice. As C.S. Lewis said so well, there are only two kinds of people in the end, just two. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. Jesus said, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself and my friends. He's been doing it here this morning. 
Every time we tell the story of Jesus through the power of his spirit, each of us is being drawn to climb that hill again, to see what there is to see, to hear what there is to hear, to feel what there is to feel. We are being drawn again and we are told, Ellen White reminds us in a glorious phrase, that if we don't resist this drawing, we will be led to the foot of the cross in repentance for the sins that crucified the Savior. Do you believe it? I do. Today, friends, I'm praying that you will join me at the foot of the cross. I'm praying for the pastors of this church. I'm praying for the elders and the deacons and for all who serve. I'm praying for the students in this congregation. I'm praying for the grandparents and the young parents and for the teenagers and for the little kids in our family. I'm praying for the visitors who walked in the door this morning and for all who may be viewing this on YouTube or Facebook. Join me. Join me at the foot of that crossbar of contradiction. Join me in saying to Jesus as he hangs there with the weight of all our sins, Lord, just because you are there on that cross, I will believe in you. Just because you take my place and bear my penalty, I will put my trust in you. We won't evade you, Lord. We won't avoid you anymore. We'll climb this mountain. And by your grace, through your grace, because of your grace, empowered by your grace, we will climb this hill called Calvary every day you give us breath until you call us home to glory. That's my promise, Lord. That's our promise, Lord. And all God's people said, amen. amen, and amen, and amen, and amen.
And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>